Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So hello and welcome to this NPTEL course entitled 20th Century Fiction where we are looking at T.S. Eliot's poem The Love Song and J. Alfred Prufrock. So in this particular lecture we will finish this poem and we will just wind up with some of the uh, general discussions we have on this poem and Eliot's early poetry in general. So we have seen how this poem is among other things a poem about procrastination, it is about this indecision, this inhabiting the, an indecisive moment. Uh, to be or not to be, to go or not to go. Uh, he, the speaker, the male speaker in this particular poem uh, is obviously quite neurotic and he cannot bring himself to go to a particular space that he wants to inhabit, he wants to have access. And that space is a social space, it's a high prestige space, uh, it's got high prestige markers about it and it's a space women come and go talking to Michelangelo. So again Michelangelo becomes here a metaphor for high art. A uh, metaphor for high culture, which is consumed by a very privileged clientele, a privileged uh, set, a privileged uh, group of consumers. Right? That's the same, that's the space where this male speaker wants to go, but obviously he cannot bring himself to to visit that place. And that entire the failure to visit a place, like the failure to narrate the experience, becomes part of the uh, uh, poetry in this particular uh, poem, uh, the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. And just uh, if you remember when we ended the last lecture. We talked about uh, how the speaker keeps saying that you know this constant references to that is not what I meant at all, that is not what I meant at all. This difference between what you mean and what you are able to say is something which is dramatized in, in this particular poem. That difference becomes uh, an epistemic difference, a difference in level of knowledge, but it also becomes a difference uh, which is quite existential in quality. You know as a human being, as a human subject, you know a certain knowledge, you, you have access to a certain knowledge and the knowledge can be one of darkness. Uh, the knowledge could be one of uh, enlightenment, the knowledge could be one of epiphany, etc. But he cannot bring himself to tell the knowledge, to convey that knowledge. And this failure to convey, this failure to narrate becomes a very big uh, part of the narrative politics in this particular poem. Now, those of you who have read Renaissance the Theatre would know that one of the uh, most famous literary examples of this procrastination, of this indecision is Shakespeare's Hamlet. Uh, and now interestingly Hamlet is brought in in this particular poem as well uh, as an intertextual reference. So what is intertextual reference? An intertextual reference or intertextuality is a process through which one particular text, a fictional text, refers to another text uh, in order to convey a point, to corroborate a point, to uh, emphasize a certain point. Now that reference to another text is like a hyperlink condition that reference to another text becomes part of the narrative politics. Uh, of this particular, uh, that particular you know, text. So let us say if text A uh, is mentioning text B uh, as some kind of reference uh, in terms of the content that text A carries, then that process through which that uh, reference is made, that becomes a part of the narrative politics of text A. Right. So, you see that in films as well. Let us say for instance, you can have a film which has a particular scene in which the characters in that scene refer to some other film. Uh, where there was presumably a, a similar situation or a different situation. Now, what that does is that it uh, makes the connect uh, interesting and at the same time it emphasizes the point uh, either as a comparison or as a contrast. Now, there is an intertextual reference to Hamlet in this particular poem when Prufrock says that you know the reference to Hamlet is made, but interestingly uh, the reference, the comparison is made only to negate it. So the speaker very say when the moment he mentions Hamlet, very quickly he says that I'm not Prince Hamlet, no was meant to be, and I'm going to read this down there in a moment. But just before we do that, it's important to see how the intertextuality plays out in proof form. It's a comparison by contrast. So you know the comparison is made just to emphasize the contrast, just to underline the contrast, and that underlining the contrast becomes an important thing, right? So that's uh, that's something which. Uh, the male speaker does uh, quite interestingly in this poem. Right? So, again among other things uh, the reference to Hamlet is also a marker of high art right? like Michelangelo. Right? So, we just saw how Michelangelo becomes a metaphor for high art 
and its consumption, you know, high culture and its consumption. So, culture obviously over here becomes uh, an activity of consumption, a process of consumption, right? And that's something which we need to uh, keep in mind very, very uh, consistently. The culture in Prufa, culture in Elit's early poetry, is always a process of consumption, a process through which certain artifacts are consumed, a process through which certain ideas are consumed, a process through which certain artworks are consumed, etc. Right? Now, Hamlet, again, uh, corroborates the consumption process. It, it, it continues uh, that uh, process of consumption. Now, this is what the speaker says uh, uh, in terms of reference to Hamlet and this is right after uh, the speaker has made multiple references to the inability uh, to tell what he actually means uh, and also uh, he's foregrounded the fact that what he's saying is not exactly what he meant at all. So, right, that is not what I meant at all, that is not it at all. These are the lines with which the stanza ended, the stanza which we um, looked at the last lecture ended. Right? So, again the difference, the, the schism between uh, meaning and narrating, the schism between what you mean and what you are able to narrate, that, that schism becomes quite dramatic uh, in proof of and that schism is epistemic, that schism is also existential, right? it becomes almost like an existential crisis and this is something which we saw also in Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness as I mentioned. Uh, you know, there's a lot of references, there's a lot of connect that could be made between uh, Proof of and Heart of Darkness because even there, as you know by now, we've just finished the text, Marlowe when he comes back from Congo is not able to convey what took place in Congo, is not able to put that into a narrative which is solid and consistent and robust and which can be consumed uh, consistently. And therein lies the uh, slight absurdity, the danger of absurdity in Marlowe's narrative in Heart of Darkness. Okay. So, with that uh, narrative politics in mind, let's come to what this speaker is saying and this should be on the screen where he's saying, No, I'm not Prince Hamlet, nor was meant to be. I'm an attended lord, one that will do to swell a progress, start a scene or two. Advice a prince, no doubt, an easy tool, deferential, glad to be of use, politic, cautious and meticulous, full of high sentence but a bit of tears, at times indeed almost ridiculous almost at times the fool. So, the, the look at the bracket over here, it starts with Hamlet and ends with a fool, right. So, Hamlet obviously is this melancholic, uh, is an embodiment of melancholic masculinity which is, uh, which has been glamorized in theatre, you know that, that image of this, you know, melancholic prince uh, standing in the middle of the theatre and delivering very profound lines, uh, that has always become a, a very glamorous, that has always carried a lot of glamour quotient. Uh, in theatre, in a way theatre has been consumed and, and produced, right. So, Hamlet becomes a marker of the glamour, a marker of the glamorous masculine melancholia, uh, which is princely, royal, profound, philosophical, etc. So, the reference to Prince Hamlet is made and again the word Prince is interesting because that is what has been conveyed to us, that this, this belongs to a higher pedestal of masculinity, this belongs to a higher pedestal of melancholia. So, melancholia or the self-absorbed man is something which uh, Hamlet represents or embodies uh, you know, in, in culture, in high culture. So, the reference is made to Hamlet only to undercut it immediately because the speaker is saying over here, I am not Prince Hamlet nor was meant to be, I'm, I was never meant to be a prince. Uh, and then of course, we have a series of uh, adjectives, series of uh, epithets, series of uh, you know, descriptions about what he actually is. So, what is he? Uh, he is an attended lord, so I am very much a secondary person, I am very much a second fiddle, I am very much a person who is not uh, really, uh, you know, who is not equipped uh, to be in the foreground, who is not equipped to be the centre of attention. One that will do to swell a progress, start a scene or two, so I, I can at best start a scene or two, I can at best um, swell a progress. Uh, I can advise a prince, advise a prince no doubt an easier tool. Right, so I can advise the prince. So my my job, my my position, my location over here is primarily uh, that of an advisor. I'm someone who's a second fiddle. I'm someone who's uh, in the background. I can always blend in the background, but I can never be the prince Hamlet. I can, I can never be the center stage of attention because if I were that, then I could have easily have access uh, or have had access to that room where women come and go talking to Michelangelo. The fact that I cannot go there. It means that I'm someone who's always relegated to the background. That relegation is also part of the existential alienation that a speaker says away, the speaker experiences over here. So that experiential and existential alienation of the speaker is something which is constantly foregrounded and you know and that becomes part of the self-effacing uh, uh, maneuver away. So he's obviously uh, being very, very self officious and uh, he's facing himself completely, he's not saying that I'm I'm a big prince. In in fact he's just cutting himself down, he's just making his alienation more and more prominent, 
right? So he says that you know, I'm deferential, I'm glad to be of use. So I'm a very usable person, but then I'm also very deferential, I'm very respectful. I'm not someone who is haughty or arrogant or pompous or proud. Uh, I'm definitely not someone who is in the center of attention. I don't belong there, right? So I'm someone who is just a, you know, a, 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 you know, a second fiddle. I'm an attendant lot, one that can start a scheme, solo progress, advice a prince, but that's about it. Deferential, glad to be of use, politic, cautious and meticulous. I'm politically correct. Uh, I am parliamentary, uh, I'm cautious, I'm guarded, I'm very meticulous, I'm also very, very, I pay attention to details, uh, full of high sentence, I can be pompous, but a bit obtuse, I can also be obtuse, I can also be, you know, uh, esoteric and pompous in a very, very negative way. At times, indeed, almost ridiculous, almost at times, the fool. Now, this whole idea of this ridiculous and the fool is interesting because the fool in Shakespeare is a very, uh, complex character, as I'm, I'm sure most of you are aware of it. Uh, the fool is not really uh, a jester in Shakespeare. The fool is also a philosopher in Shakespeare. But the only difference is, unlike Hamlet, who is also a philosopher, who is a philosopher prince, and that's how it's perceived and, and, and consumed in popular culture, the fool in Shakespeare is not taken seriously. He's not someone who's taken seriously. He's not someone who's paid attention to. But oftentimes you find it is a fool who has access to maximum information. Uh, it's a fool who has access to maximum insight. Right? And this combination of insight and information that a fool, fool has uh, is often a very futile combination because you know, it ends up being nothing. It ends up being uh, just uh, very meaningless and purposeless uh, kind of a combination. So the fool over here becomes a metaphor of purposelessness. The fool over here becomes a metaphor of importance, you know, as someone who is completely powerless despite the prophetic uh, quality that he or she may have. Uh, and you know, this is what uh, the state of uh, uh, proof hoc is. A proof hoc is at best a fool, uh, someone who probably knows things, someone who probably has a knowledge of reality, uh, pr probably has a knowledge of what is the darkness around, what is the deception around, what is the pretense around, but then he cannot really bring himself to utter it or to articulate it or narrativize it, uh, not least because he will not be taken seriously. Right? And the sort of lack of seriousness with which he is perceived the lack of seriousness with which he has which, which he's been received is something which uh, gnaws at his personality, something which cuts into his personality, something which alienates him further. Right? And this alienation is interesting uh, in terms of uh, how this, uh, you know, this whole narrative drama plays out. And this narrative drama is also psychological drama, as you know, it's something which uh, he's experiencing, it's experiential, it's psychological, it's existential. But what it does essentially, in, in terms of all coming together, it alienates them. It alienates them socially, it alienates them psychologically, and it just makes them more and more self-effacing. So the self-effacement that we see over here is part of the alienation uh, in a process, it's part of the process through which the speaker or the human subject gets more and more disconnected to the reality around them. Right? So there's a lack of desire, there's a lack of connect, there's a lack of warmth, there's a lack of cognition, and all that, all those lacks, all those crises are combined together uh, and inform the narrative crisis of the speaker. Right? So again, like Heart of Darkness, we have the narrative crisis and the cognitive crisis coming together to generate a very unique and dark existential crisis. Okay? And now we have this image of senility, uh, which is depicted to us in an old age creeping in, I grow old, I grow old, as to where the bottoms of my trousers rolled. So again, the whole idea, uh, look at the way in which something as uh, profound and existential as senility is described with some uh, sartorial markers. Right? So the bottoms of trousers rolled becomes a marker of old age. So when an old age comes, you, you can't, you're not really a straight person, uh, you know, in a straight sense, you're not really strong, you don't really have a very strong gait, you don't really have uh, very, very strong features anymore, so you have to roll your trousers, right? So because you can't, uh, you know, you're always, uh, you know, bending down, you're not really straight and arrogant and pompous and strong anymore. So that, again, that becomes a part of the, uh, you know, the masculine crisis in this particular poem. The fact that he has to roll the bottoms of his trousers now, he has to sort of roll it down in order to fit in because his body is shrinking. And again, you know, that could be connected to Shakespeare's seven stages of man and that stage where the human being, the human limbs, the human body begins to shrink because of old age. It's something which has been referred to over here. So I grow old, I grow old, I shall wear the bottoms of my trousers rolled. And then the speaker goes on to say, shall I part my hair behind? Do I dare to eat a peach? I shall wear white flannel trousers and walk upon the beach. I have heard the mermaid singing 
each to each, right? So again, uh, the whole idea of uh, rhetorical question, shall I part my hair behind? Do I dare to eat a peach? And the peach is interesting over here because you know, the peach is also reminiscent uh, of the forbidden fruit, you know, and there's a, if you take a look at different versions of uh, the uh, original scene story, you find there are certain versions which talk about the fruit as a peach and not really apple the way it is you know, popularly perceived that Adam and Eve they ate an apple. But in certain versions which are sometimes considered more authentic, the forbidden fruit is actually a peach. So do I dare to, to eat a peach? So that becomes uh, as a moment of, as a marker of transgression. Uh, the peach over here becomes a marker of transgression. The speaker is asking himself, do I dare transgress? Do I dare be subversive? So shall I part my hair behind? So something very domestic and mundane, uh, something related to appearance at a very mundane level. And immediately that is related to, that is equated with something almost uh, cosmic in quality in terms of dimension. Do I dare to eat a peach? Do I dare to transgress? And do I dare to part my hair behind? and do our data transgress. It will put together in a very interesting, uh, curious combination of opposites. And it also has a sort of a bathetic quality. And I talked about Bathurst as a already. Bathurst has an anticlimactic thing. So we have a pitch towards which you're progressing and suddenly there's a dip. Uh, and it, it falls into something which is flat and funny and flippant. And then it rises again uh, into something which is profound and almost cosmic in quality. So there's no consistency in terms of significance. It just goes up and down. It dips up and down. And there's a reference to white flannel trousers. I shall wear white flannel trousers and walk upon the beach. I've heard the mermaid singing each to each. So again, this whole idea of mermaids over here becomes interesting because uh, if you take a look at the poem at the end, it becomes uh, increasingly a death song, uh, a song of death, right? So it's like a death knell. Right, so the mermaids are singing each to each, and this whole idea of the male speaker walking upon a beach wearing one flannel trousers, hearing mermaids. It becomes a very dreamlike, again, very cinematic sequence. If you take a look at some of the expressions in cinema at that time, you find these are, those films have scenes full of these, uh, full of these types, uh, where uh, suddenly this dream of a human subject, this dreaming human subject, finds uh, herself on a beach surrounded by uh, fairies and mermaids, uh, and sometimes people would, from real life, and then they find themselves rolling and sometimes flowing along the beach. So the beach, the sea, they become uh, metaphors or, or instruments of endlessness against which uh, the human, uh, the limited human frame, the finite frame of the human body is situated in order to create a contrast, this limitlessness of the sea with the finite of the, uh, the human frame. So I've heard the mermaid singing each to each. I do not think that they will sing to me. So again, this is the death of desire that has been described over here. So I do not think the mermaids will ever sing to me because I'm not desired as a person. Uh, and this inability to hear the mermaids uh, singing to him, and this inability to believe that the mermaids can sing to him, but it becomes part of the death of desire process or the, uh, no, the Thanatos process, uh, if you will. So if you take a look at this, you know, two very broad divisions, Eros and Thanatos, Eros being life, uh, you know, sexuality, productivity, fertility, and Thanatos being just the opposite, death, you know, lack of productivity, lack of sexuality, lack of fertility. Uh, so the speaker over here is moving more and more towards a Thanatos zone. In other words, this poem now begins to become uh, a death poem. So it's not really a love song, it's a poem about lovelessness, right? So the lovelessness becomes uh, uh, foregrounded over and over again uh, in, as a dramatic category, as an experiential category. So the speaker becomes uh, acutely aware of the lovelessness that he's experiencing over here. So that's why the line, I do not think that they will sing to me. So again, it's a whole idea of existential alienation, the fact that he's cut off from all, uh, you know, all desire, all attention, from all human warmth, that becomes part of the existential problem that he's experiencing over here. I've seen them riding seaward on the waves, combing the hair, white hair of the waves blown back when the wind blows the water white and black. We have lingered in the chambers of the sea by seagulls writhed with sea brow, seaweed red and brown till human voices wake us and we drown. So again, this whole idea of a, a, a dream sequence being interrupted, uh, being cut by human voices. Uh, and interestingly see uh, how waking up is also an act of drowning because prior to that, uh, we have uh, you know, the whole idea of the, uh, the dream elevating you, right? So riding seaward on the waves uh, and then uh, the whole idea of the, uh, the human subject lingering in the chambers of the sea. And if you go back to the beginning of the poem where the image of the uh, sea animal uh, you know, I should be in a pair of ragged claws, cuttling over the floors of silent seas. So again, 
the flows of silent seas, the chambers of the sea, they all come back over here. So all these different fluid images, they have sometimes an amniotic quality in which uh, you know, it, it can contain the human subject. So it's almost like a womb-like quality in which the human subject seeks solace, the human subject seeks situatedness or seeks comfort, right? So the chambers of the sea becomes over here an amniotic uh, space where the human subject you know, desires comfort, the human subject desires protection, right? But that is denied to him uh, very, very quickly uh, because human voices wake him down, wake him up, and uh, as soon as he wakes up, he drowns. So, so until human voices wake us and, and we drown. So we have lingered in the chambers of the sea by seagulls writh with sea with red and brown till human voices wake us and we drown. So rather, it's this whole idea of waking up and then drowning uh, the drowning becoming an image of helpless sinking uh, or passive uh, surrender becomes interesting over here. Uh, because while the fluidity of the sea is amniotic, while the dreams or sequence of uh, you know, mermaids singing each to each becomes liberating, human voices waking up uh, can only entail drowning. Now, what that does, and this is going back to something we discussed already, human voices wake you up into clock time. Right, so this becomes a departure from real time or psychological time. So if you remember, I mentioned uh, Ori Burke's song, uh, H E N R I Ori Burke's song, B E R G S O N. And Ori Burke's song had two dimensions of time that he theorized one is clock time and one is psychological time, or clock time and real time. So, real time or psychological time is the time that we situate, uh, that in which you, we are situated as human subjects, as feeling human subjects, right? And that, that the whole idea of inhabiting a time in which you can feel and experience uh, gives you a sense of agency, right? So that becomes a unique time, that becomes a time that is uniquely available to you. And hence the psychological time, hence is real time according to Bergson. Now if you contrast that to clock time, clock time is standard, clock time is standardized, clock time is uniform, clock time is democratic, clock time is equally accessible by everyone. So clock time doesn't make a difference in terms of the phenomenal feeling of the human subject. So the only way in which you can convert a feeling into time is by inhabiting real time or psychological time. Now this bit at the end where the human subject is saying, till human voices wake us and we drown. So when you, when you wake up, we cut back into clock time. When we wake up, we cease to be in real time or psychological time. Uh, because then we, we wake up in a world where everything is the same, where everything is uniform, where everything is standard. And this whole idea of standardization and uniformity, it undercuts any idea of clock, uh, or of any idea of real time, any idea of psychological time, which can be liberating and elevating. So at the end of the poem, we find this is actually about time. This is actually about procrastination. This is actually about uh, spatialization of time, where time becomes space. And in the process, the desire to inhabit that space time, the desire to inhabit that time. So desire to move into time, right? And of course, the whole idea of um, you know, the, 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 the crisis over here is a crisis which comes where we get more and more uh, alienated from time. So that space where women come and go talking to Michelangelo. Again, look at the spatial temporal quality. The women are coming and going, which is so spatial as well as temporal. They're coming and going at certain times, which is periodic in quality. Uh, that movement and the speaker wants to have access to that space time. Uh, so that spatial temporality becomes a very interesting phenomena uh, in Eliot's early poetry, especially in this particular poem. Right? And so the last image is important, human voices waking us, uh, you know, the human subjects are waking up by human voices and then you wake up into reality, you wake up into standardized routine existence or routine rituals which are a very far move, a very far uh, departure from the elevation and the romance of psychological time uh, and, and, and real time. The speaker had briefly uh, experienced and enjoyed in his dreamlike sequence with the mermaids, right? So with that we come to the end of the poem. So it is among other things a poem about time, a poem about procrastination, a poem about exhaustion, a poem about melancholia and it's also a poem about culture and its consumption, right? So how do you become, how culture is inequally consumed, right? So culture becomes an act of consumption, fair enough. But then the, the act of consumption is a very inequal in quality. Uh, there's, there are privileged consumption, consumptions, the privileged markers of consumption, and equally there's also inadequate consumption or markers of inadequate consumption. And obviously the speaker in this particular poem, J. Alfred Prufrock, he becomes an embodiment of inadequate consumption. He in a way gets consumed because of his inadequate consumption. So he's being looked at, he's been gazed at. So if you take a look, if you remember the, uh, some of the old lines which we uh, 
read with some details how certain parts of the body, certain parts of the dresses are sort of scrutinized and, and zoomed in uh, using almost a magnifying glass. And this magnification is a very cinematic process uh, where a certain object is magnified, where a certain object is sort of blown out of proportion just to convey a particular image, just to convey a particular point. And you find how the necktie, uh, the hairbrush bag, uh, the trousers rolled. So, all these different sartorial and bodily markers, they are actually, uh, they are reflective of the speaker's embodiment or rather the crisis in embodiment. And as you remember, embodiment is an entanglement of the neural and the discursive negotiations that a human subject makes with the world around him or her. Right, so the neural and the discursive. So it is psychological, it is embedded, but equally it is extended. Right, so this embedded, extended quality of embodiment becomes a very important quality. And we find over here the speaker is trying to corroborate this lack of embodiment by looking at how the embedded as well as the extended qualities are compromised. So the embedded quality is compromised because he's psychologically confused, he's procrastinating all the time, he doesn't quite know how to convert an experience into a language, understandable language, and there's also a problem with extended embodiment because you cannot inhabit the space, the privileged space where women come and go talking in Michelangelo, the space of high culture, the space of privilege, right. So, these are some of the salient fundamental points that this particular poem uh, looks at in great detail. So, as you know by now, as you uh, agree by now hopefully, this is one of the most important pieces of literature written in modernist periods because it ticks all the modernist boxes as we read it today. It has stream of consciousness, it has clock time and psychological time, it has neurosis, modernism is also often about neurosis. It also has moments of epiphany where you have this light bulb moment where you realize something which you remember something and that elevates you and liberates you as a superior human being, right. So, that, that those epiphanic moments are also there in this particular poem, although it all, it all ends in futility and purposelessness. And the last image of the human subjects drowning in a sea of voices is interesting because, you know, and again if you take a look at it more literally, this human voices which are waking them up are standardized voices and they drown their voices, they drown their unique subjectivity, they drown their unique agency. And this drowning of the agency is important over here and that is something which the speaker is fearing that that is one of the threats of modernism, uh, the complete annihilation of agency, the drowning of agency, the fact that the human body, the human subject, the human mind, the human feeling frame, they all drowned uh, by different uh, instruments of standardization, by different instruments of utility and by different instruments of uniformity. So, uniformity and utility, those become the biggest torch bearers of modernist uh, achievements or modernity, the achievements of modernity, against which we have the human subject with its ambivalence, with its procrastination, with its uh, melancholia, who is trying to insufficiently situate himself in that uniform standardized space. And so, the whole poem is about the failure to situate yourself spatio-temporally. So, you know, situating yourself, uh, it entails a spatio-temporal situation. It has to be in a particular space, it has to be in a particular time and it has to be a combination of space and time. And that combination, that, that combined quality of spatial temporality is something which the speaker can never inhabit fully or adequately and that is what the poem is all about. It is about inadequate embodiment and that accounts for procrastination, that accounts for indecision, that accounts for the narrative crisis and that, that accounts also for the cognitive crisis. So, some of these are some of the uh, issues which we will take up when we read the next poem that we will study in this particular course, which is also from Eliot's uh, uh, proof of another observation, but that would be a poem called Preludes. Uh, but with this we come to an end of the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. We will move on to Preludes for the next lecture. Thank you for your attention.